Okay, I'll be talking about the maturity assessment in FinOps. You know, HCL Tech Hybrid FinOps, you know, it's, it's, it covers the entire hybrid multi-cloud. We do not look, out, uh, look for the public cloud alone. It's an entire hybrid multi-cloud based approach. And you know, the, the entire framework is based on six point approach powered by the practitioner mindset. When I say practitioner mindset, you know, it's powered by their, the best practices and the learnings that we gather from one environment and we, can, we are able to easily pass on to the other environment, right? That's the uniqueness of HCL's FinOps framework. And from the differentiator point of view, these are the various differentiators. Just to talk about a couple of the differentiators, the, the first and foremost is the proactive FinOps. Our FinOps consulting and the services is completely a proactive, not just the reactive based. When I say proactive, you know, it's, it's completely based on the policies and the architecture-led FinOps. You know, how do you do a replatforming? How can you uh, change the architecture, you know, so that your cost consumed is less? At the same time, you effectively consume the cloud. And the second uh, uh, differentiator is benchmarking. So we help customers to do an internal benchmarking and also an external benchmarking. Then from an en environment st uh, standpoint and from an integration standpoint, we look at hybrid multi-cloud as a holistic view. Right? We look at the entire tools uh, from a cost and alerting standpoint, right? and it's the complete governance process when it comes to FinOps. We do not look at CloudOps and FinOps as the two different pillars. Right? It's, it's a hybrid, multi-cloud, FinOps blended with CloudOps. And from a governance uh, standpoint, in terms of the various pillars, you can see various pillars here. You know, I just want to talk a couple of pointers. You know, this is a very busy slide. Uh, you know, as we talked, hybrid uh, head sales FinOps uh, focuses on hybrid multi-cloud. It includes the PaaS and SaaS as well, right? We do not see the on-prem, we do not look at the SaaS, uh, you know, in an in a exclusion manner. We look at SaaS as well. How can you do a license management from a database standpoint, from a SaaS standpoint, right? So you, you look at the uh, ineffective user licenses in a SaaS environment. How can you do an optimization uh, in a SaaS environment? And the same st goes to the on-prem as well, right? So on the on-prem facility cost, the virtualization cost, storage cost, all those costs as well is ingested into a single dashboard. Then you look at the whole IT cost in a single dashboard view. Then a policy-based and the proactive governance, and that includes the security complaints as well. You know, that, that lists down all the levers that you see here. Uh, then the demand management. This is, this is another proactive FinOps uh, levers, you know, that talks about automated orchestration, uh, policy-based provisioning, and it's completely uh, uh, proactive-based and not at all a reactive-based. Then moving back, you know, from a maturity journey standpoint, these are the various levers, you know, we categorize our customers, we baseline the maturity of the FinOps across these levers, right, across these levels. Uh, you can see five levels. The initial uh, level one and level two, you know, it's more of there is absolutely no uh, FinOps at all, or there is, there is it's a reactive based FinOps. I mean, if, they, if there is a unexpected cost spike, they go and do a FinOps optimization. The third level, which is reactive and repeatable, this, this is, you know, here as well, there is certain reactive optimization process. Right, but then you leverage only the cloud native tool. You don't have a holistic view of the unified dashboard and you know, granular showback and all that. So, but there is no reservation. You, you do not know how much of the workload is going to uh, you know, continue in the longer time so that you can get into a reservation. Then the fourth level is, is where you leverage the third party tool. You have a big environment. You know how to manage, how to do a showback, how to do a granular costing and the showback. How can you bring the automation, right? And again, in the fourth level as well, each team focuses on their own FinOps maturity, right? They have their own methodology, own tools. You don't have a unified, CC, centralized CCOE, right? And the fifth level, which is a matured, optimized level, this is where we define the run, right? So this, this, this is where we have a CCOE, this is a centralized FinOps team. That's what we talk about in the FinOps Foundation, right? So you need to have a CCOE, which is a centralized team, which is driving the FinOps. And that's, this is how we 
uh, level the customers, we baseline the customer, and then we move the customers from one uh, stage to another. Then we give the roadmap, and then we drive their uh, adoption, uh, FinOps adoption within their environment. Um, then coming back to assessment, so to, to, to do a baseline, you know, you need to do an assessment, right? So these are the various parameters and the levers that we look at from an assessment standpoint. You know, the, uh, you know, all of us know cost visibility, cost allocation. You know, when it comes to all the levers, you will see the entire environment is listed, right? Be it IaaS, PaaS, and your on-prem database and containers, right? And your on-prem facility cost, storage cost, all of them and hierarchy-based showback and chargeback, you know, does, does customer, does the environment have it or not? You need to have a look at those parameters as well to determine where they stand today. And the cost allocation, right? What is the tagging strategy? Do they have a st tagging strategy or not? What is their data model? How do they want to have a showback reporting? There are multiple business units within the customer environment, right? How can you do the, uh, you know, showback reporting? for what, which type of stakeholders, right? So all those aspects also have to be there, have to be assessed. And tagging compliance, and from a governance standpoint, right, from overall integration, we talked about the process as well. How can, can do you, does customer have a KPI? KPI is a very, very important key performance indicators, very important aspect to define in the beginning of the FinOps journey so that your FinOps process is governed automatically all the stakeholders who is part of this IT journey, they understand the need of the FinOps governance. They know proactively they start adopting to the culture because they have to, main, they have to meet the KPI. So it's important to have this KPI definition defined and how can you measure, how can you have your cost alerted into your overall alerting system. Right? So those are all defined under the governance and the process aspects as well is looked at. You know, do you have a normally detection process, redressal process? So all those process, forecasting process, all those process is also looked at from a governance standpoint. Um, then uh, the proactive and the architecture-led FinOps, um, you know, in, in which you know, we, we look at the detailed architecture of the customer on the cloud foundation and their on-prem architecture as well. Some of the technologies may require a re-platforming without impacting the customer's performance, customer's end outcome, but still you will be able to achieve with a less cost. So those aspects are also looked at, you know, when it comes to a cloud storage, on-prem storage, compute, containers, platforms, all those aspects, all the, uh, all the domains are looked at from an architecture-led standpoint, right? So that you don't have to really worry about recurring cost, you know, you adopt to the right technology for the right outcome and for the right need, right? Then um, the optimization, uh, how well are, uh, is the environment in terms of optimization, right? Especially on containers, do you have a right uh, tagging? Is your names, uh, namespaces tagged or not? How are you doing a license management uh, from a database standpoint? Have they adopted to the right type of licenses, right? Enterprises versus standard. Then uh, how about the uh, on-prem licenses, is that all adopted to the cloud in terms of Azure hybrid or you know, any cloud that customer has already adopted to, right? Uh, then the forecasting and saving investment. And forecasting itself is a big area. You know, do, can you really address what if scenarios? Do you have an ability to do a simulation? If my budget goes from X to X, X to Y, you know, do I, do I have a right strategy to deal with? You know, what, are, what is the implication and impact of it? And do they have you know, such process or such tools to do the forecasting or not? Then is there a budget management? So all these pillars, the assessment, uh, we have a very, very detailed questionnaire uh, in the framework that looks at the entire areas. And, and this is a sample report that you see. You, know, you can see the 12 uh, areas, the left-hand side. Across all the levers, we have a very detailed uh, methodology to assess the environment and then create a baseline. It gives you the overall score as well. You know, this this 62%. And then we go back and give the customer, you know, this is the action roadmap. And then we define them whether they are in crawl, run, and then you know, crawl, walk, or run. Then we give them a roadmap of how you can move from one phase to the another phase, right? Um, then I, I would like to talk, you know, the two proactive FinOps strategies, right? How can we 
how can you drive the proactive FinOps within your own environment as a practitioner? You know, the auto-scaling strategy, you may not do an auto-scaling for all type of workload in your environment, possibly some of the workload that requires auto-scaling, right? Uh, there are multiple times that in a year you keep scaling, right? Uh, for, for those type of workload, you may, the, those may be the candidate for your auto-scaling, right? Or it could be a very frequent time, uh, very frequent opportunities, your workload is getting scaled. Maybe during only Christmas, right? Now my workload is increasing and I'm scaling my instances, right? Do I really need to have a redundant instances in my environment and I, I, need, I need to keep paying recurring way, right? I, there's, there's no need. So these, these are the candidates that are chosen and then you need to have a right strategy. And this is the strategy that talks about how do you do auto scaling, right? These are the various type of resources. This is an example for an Azure environment. So the limitation of time, we just wanted to talk on one cloud. How do you do a scaling strategy? These are the type of resources uh, of, you know, which are eligible for auto scaling. What are the different types of triggers, right? It could be a CPU based trigger, memory based trigger, or it could be an IOPS based trigger, right? So the trigger can be any, uh, in, uh, through any ways. You need to do an analysis of how your workload increases. What is the right metric to choose? against which this auto scaling can be configured, right? And it could be even the time. I know very well that every night, you know, my instances, the load goes high, so let me scale up the instances before 30 minutes, right? That can also be a strategy because you know that it, 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 uh, every day it increases, the load increases, right? Then the auto scaling rules, there can be various rules, the metric based, time based and all that. And the actions, you know, it could be as simple as, you know, you scale, and it can be a notification, you can create an alert, or you, know, you can send an email, um, and then uh, you, know, you can also trigger an automation, right? So if, if, there, is an, uh, in, if there is an auto scaling, if the instance gets increased, you, know, you can possibly trigger uh, subsequent actions using the automation runbook, right? It could be to heal something, maybe you know, if, it's, if it's not the intended auto scaling, you may possibly alert some other function, right? It, you know, you can, you can, based on this strategy, you can define, uh, based on your workload type and the environment, you can define the auto-scaling strategy so that your, you can avoid the redundant instances cost, be it compute, be it storage, be it your Azure functions, the SaaS functions, could be for any of the resources. And then coming back to the uh, SKU standardization, you know, uh, we normally do not suggest the customers to do the reservation upfront, right? And uh, the, the first uh, action is, in fact, you know, to uh, do a cost optimization. How do you do an optimizing the SKU before you even do standardization? The, the optimizing the SKU, you look at, uh, you know, the, uh, the most frequently used SKUs, and then see if you can move the other SKUs into the most frequently used SKUs, and you can optimize across the SKUs before before you take a decision to do any reservation or right sizing, right? Then you do a right sizing. You know that there are 100 SKUs and you have reduced that to 10 SKUs, for example. And out of these 10 SKUs, these are the 10 SKUs that's, that are going to be standardized. Then you need to decide for what type of workloads and what type of SKUs need to be chosen. That's your SKU strategy. So before we do a reservation, you need to do a right sizing so that your reservation is optimized and utilized properly and you have invested at the right for the right type of SKUs. And, and once you do the reservation, then that's where you, know, you will have a standardized SKU, right, in your, for your environment, which can be fed as an automated orchestration rule as well, right? While you place the workload, while you provisioning itself, you can put a provisioning policy for this type of users, this type of workload, this is the only SKU that can be selected. So you can, you can create a blueprint, you can allocate, uh, you know, you, you can give the uh, access to only the right stakeholders so that they can provision only this type of SKU. This brings the proactive FinOps as a culture within the organization. You, there is no manual intervention at all. And if someone tries to breach this policy somewhere, you know there's an alert, right? And it gets alerted, your CMP tool will alert. And even if there is an attempt, the attempt will not be successful because they are, they, they are given only certain entitlement. The blueprint will be entitled for the selective users 
for the selective resources as well. Moving back, uh, we talked about the KPI. Now, these are the different KPIs, the sample KPIs that we suggest to our customers. And based on the environment and the customer's needs, the KPI would be customized, right? There are different types of KPI, the commercial KPI, line of business, and the functional and operation, operational KPIs. And there are various roles that are mentioned as well. For each type of stakeholders, you have different KPIs. The moment you define the KPIs, you know, then your 60% of your adaptation of and offs is, is, is done, right? So it, it, because there's a culture that's already set up, and the people know what to follow, what they need to be complied with, and they will automatically follow. They know very well if they don't uh, comply to the KPI, you know, they, there'll be an impact, right? When it comes to cost, when it comes to tagging, uh, when it comes to a, you know, commercial implication, the RA coverage, how effectively they are utilizing RA, right? How effective their scheduling policies are? What are those violations? How many violations? How many security breaches that happens in their environment, right? All those are part of KPA. KPA is just not cost anomalies alone, right? Um, with that, you know, uh, the whole uh, proactive and the reactive FNOFs, uh, these are some of the experiences, you know, that Hetzel Tech experiences. You see different types of customers. Um, you know, the, the themes that, the main theme uh, using which we, would, we were able to adopt the FinOps as a process within their environment. You know, you can see the various themes here, governance and automation via policies. Uh, for some of them, that could be, that is one, one type of problem. And for another, you know, the uh, in, uh, inculcating an organization chain, the, the whole culture itself had to be changed, right? Um, then then uh, another type of customer is completely architecture-led FinOps. We get a lot of customers wherein they already do, uh, you know, the basic IaaS FinOps optimization on their own, and they want us to focus only on architecture-led, right? How can we bring the best practices and figure out the replatforming options or changing the strategy so that the cost comes down? and the cost is governed over the period. This is how we do it for various customers. This concludes the session, so we've opened for question and answers. All right, thank you very much. So if you've got a question, raise your hand, and I shall hop foot it over to you, give you the microphone, because the, uh, the funky phone microphone got broke first session. So uh, be gentle with this one. <laughs> so, just um, just one quick, a couple of questions. So, first of all, from uh, when you were talking about your on-premise uh, data, how do you collect that? Is that food? Is that ven vendor agnostic? Do you use multiple different sources? Is it something that the customer has to provide, or is it something that you provide? So it's it's a it's a hybrid model. You know, we use the tools uh, when it comes to a virtualization environment. We use the tools. And when it comes to a non-virtualization environment, we may have to bring the manual insights, right? And let's say a customer has Oracle environment at on-prem, yeah. right? So you may not have a tool which is ingesting this. There are tools which helps us to ingest the purchase orders. There are tools which help us to ingest the facility cost, right? So we use that. You know, s some uh, use cases uh, makes us to do manually. Some use cases makes us to do using the tools itself. But we look at the overall cost, the on-prem environment, that includes the platform, that includes the uh, compute, storage, and the facility, power cost, all included. Then we do a show back, and okay. then we showcase to them that this is how, you know, there, are, there could be various stakeholders who are utilizing the same data center, for example, yeah. right? Then how can you provide a show back? And then further, it becomes a charge back for the customer. Many of the customer go for utility as a service today. Yeah. They do not want to, you know, be a uh, having the technical depth on their, you know, as asset owned, right? So for them, it is very, very helpful okay. to reduce the resource utilization. Well, fair enough. And the second question was, what's the, what was the benefit of having the most frequently used SKUs in, uh, in the cloud providers? Yeah, see, what, what happens in, uh, across all the customer environments is, you know, they, each department wants to choose their own SKUs, and they would go ahead and choose. And at the end, when, when the CCOE looks at it, there are like 50 types of SKUs 
but these 50 types are not at all utilized. And these Q family will be covered under the reservation. When you apply a reservation, you cover a skew family, right? If some of the skews which are not utilized there, which is part of your reservation, that will impact your reservation coverage. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna be doing shuttle runs across the room now. Back to this side. Here you go, sir. Um, hi, hi. Uh, great presentation, by the way. Um, so it seems like you uh, or HCL is using the, is it like a FinOps as a service? So you're helping customers, right, with doing FinOps as a service. Yeah. Are you training them and then um, helping them develop their own FinOps practice? Or is it completely outs outsourced? Um, what, what would be the answer to that one? It's, it's both the model. You know, we help customers to set up the CCOE within their own organization. Uh, for example, you know, if, if customer has to uh, define the KPI, you know, they may not need to consult us. You know, we give them, this is how a KPI needs to be framed, and you can go ahead and set it up internally within your own organization. We also help the customers with the, with the profiles and the JD and the roles that yeah. they need to set up. And if they want to set up, you know, we, we will let them set up. And we provide the consultancy services to customer. And there are some engagement wherein they want us to do the entire service to them. You know, then we go as a consulting partner and we own uh, the whole FinOps as a service. And we provide a value-based gain share model. You know, we, uh, we give you, you know, we provide this much of saving out of which you know, that's a committed saving that we can we can promise to you out of which you know there there's certain percentage that we take it provided we are able to save so both the models are available we help the customers to set up on their own at the same time we also take that up as a service and in a follow up question to that is it typically like a one year or three year engagement because it you know finops is not something that you just do and 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 stop right Absolutely. Uh, well, how do you approach uh, do you approach it as a long term type of engagement with your, your customer as opposed to like a month to month yeah, so typically uh, consulting and setting up the baseline and, and doing an initial set of work that takes uh, around six months to seven months, right? So when you do an assessment, you figure out a lot of actions and then you start doing uh, many of the uh, proactive things, right? Which initially customer may feel that it's not required, but over the time they understand the value of it. Uh, you know, especially when you configure the policies, you may not be able to give the direct cost saving. Right, cost saving is the mantra for customer when you start. Right, so it, it takes around six to seven months to do a setup, and and then we move to the day two operations uh, from FinOps side. So we make the day two FinOps engineer to be part of the overall cloud ops team. So we do not look at uh, you know these two or the two separate uh, two separate areas. Right, so which is part of our modern ops. So the entire target operating model changes as well. You know, with FinOps, we also provide SRE integrated model. So the FinOps engineer sits as part of the whole uh, cloud native modern ops model. And that's, that's how we, we continue the services in the run phase. All right, so we've got about five minutes left. Um, fantastic. So with respect to auto scaling, you mentioned uh, usually uh, for the peak seasons like Christmas and other areas. But for any, any efficiently opera operations, you need that on a daily basis. Uh, uh, in this, for example, you may have your loads during the day higher and uh, uh, end of the day lower, then you need to scale down and scale up during the peak hour of the day again. Is there any specific reason that uh, auto scaling, that uh, part of it that you talked about for only uh, scenarios like BFCM, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Christmas, things like that, not on a regular basis to be operating efficiently? Yeah, it need not be. So when we talk about auto scaling, you know, to uh, create a perfect auto scaling end-to-end -end, uh, functioning framework is not an easy job, right? So when, when you know that every day you need an incremental load at some point in time, this is happening, maybe in the night, if you have an end-to-end -end automated framework, you can, you can deploy auto-scaling every day. But what happens is on ground, doing it is not an easy job. And it takes almost three, four months. Customers have you know, some function which is perfectly working fine 
some function is not working fine. So to make your auto scaling end to end, it's a time consuming job. If you're matured in that, in, in that area, you can deploy it even for every day. I mean, you can save 15 hours cost. You, your load is increasing only for six hours, let's say, for example. You, you can. Absolutely, you can. Yeah. Cool. All right. Any more? There's one more question. Over there. I think I saw somebody with a hand up over there. I'll come back to you. Yeah, just one question on this architectural led FinOps. What are the different strategies you adopt? See, while you mentioned that IaaS and the, some of the low hanging ones is what the customer does themselves, uh, what is the intervention you guys take in terms of architectural led FinOps model? Yeah. For each tower, we have a different offering. I would like to call one or, I mean, talk about one or two, right? So let's say from a storage standpoint, we have an offering called dark data assessment. We go and look at the customer's environment. How much is the data which is unused, which is not at all touched, which is not required, you know, for which customer has been spending on the storage, you know, then on top of the storage, you know, you, it, it might not be compressed as well, and you're paying a lot, right? And it could be on a hot tier as well. That's even more killing, right? So then we go uh, do a complete assessment. Then we come back and say sometimes even the technology chosen itself would be incorrect. Right? For example, something which could which could lie on let's say a, on a blob or an ANF, it may not be lying on that. You know, you may be paying a lot of money even from your on-prem environment as well. There's a huge cost on the storage, right? So the if you when you do a dark data assessment, you figure out a lot of things which are not utilized, which are not used, touched. So we, we, we bring out a lot of uh, you know, uh, for, uh, recommendations out of it, and that brings a lot of savings. Sometimes it may require a re-platforming as well. You know, that's one such example for a story. Then we, we do have respective offerings of, across all the environment compute as well. How do you move, move the SKU? Customer would not be even upgrading the SKUs forever. When you upgrade the SKU, your cost, is, cost will come down. At the same time, you get a better performance as well. That's how cloud is created today, designed today, right? So if you don't move your SKUs at all, right, you will be paying more cost for the less performance. Why do you want to do it? At the right point in time, you need to upgrade your SKUs, right? So these are some of the uh, areas we look at so that, you know, your selection itself is correct. They do a proactive and architecture based. Instead of just looking at your wastage elimination and right sizing, which normally we do, all right, cool. Absolutely. Yeah? Okay, we have got about one minute and 45 seconds left. So, anybody got a very quick question they want to fire over? Anybody at all? Okay, I've got one. Um, KPIs. Uh, how many KPIs is enough for any one group? What's the maximum number of KPIs you think would, be make, would make sense for your big list of KPIs? Yeah, for, for the number of KPIs, you know, for each stakeholder, there are different KPIs, set of KPIs. So we can, we can, we have seen till up to minimum six or seven. You know, some of them are on security, some of them on process in terms of tagging complaints and tagging, right? That they may do tagging, but it may not be an accurate tagging. So what's the compliance? So it, it could be around six or seven. Then RA utilization coverage. Yeah, like total, right? All together, six yeah. or seven. So for each group, maybe they might have like two. Yeah. Sweet. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. All right. Thank you ever so much. That was fantastic. That was very interesting stuff. You have a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thanks for watching that session. I'm sitting here in San Diego right after FinOpsX. We hope you join us next year here live 2024. In the meantime, Please subscribe to the channel and join the community. Get involved, join the summits, get in a working group, and don't forget to get FinOps certified. It's next year here in San Diego for FinOpsX. It's gonna be twice as big. Come join the party, come meet your people. Welcome home.